Hello, everybody. I want to welcome you to our 10th annual uh, Game Changers uh, event, where we invite women, non-binary, transgender, and non-gender conforming folks to come and talk to the students in the German public about their experience in animation and games. And in this year, um, we have a spotlight on Asian and Asian American women, um, and they've come to talk to us about their, their radically different life experiences and, and time in animation and game arts. So I'm going to introduce them. Uh, we have Amy Lee Ketchum. And they're, they're going to tell you a little bit more about who they are, so I'll let them do that. Um, Mariel Knuko Cartwright. And Shang Chin Mo. So I'm going to give them the floor and let them begin talking. And um, just thank you, everyone, for coming out. And I hope you guys have a great time. Thank you, Stephen. Should grab my mic. And you want to kick off the, the story? Sure. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, as Stephen said, I'm Amy Lee Ketchum. I'm an artist and an animator and an educator. And some of my wonderful students are here from PAFA. Hey, guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for representing. Um, I wanted to start by sharing an anecdote. Um, let's see. OK. So we have all prepared an all about me page, and I wanted to uh, start with an anecdote which speaks volumes. Um, so I told my dad that I was giving a panel at Moore College, and I said, I will be giving advice on what to do if your parents don't want you to be an artist. <laughs> and my dad wrote back, you didn't listen to your father. Your father said you cannot be poor to become an artist. You will be poor when you become an artist. And I wrote, OK, I'll pass it on to the students. And he said, <laughs> sage advice. So that's a little background on me. Um, this is a slideshow of um, where I've been before I came to Philly. So I am the child of um, Asian, Ameri Asian immigrants from China. And my grandparents immigrated from, to the United States from China. Um, in the aftermath of World War II. And my parents met in California because my mother wanted to go to Disneyland and her, her friend said, my brother will drive us. And so somehow like they, they made a child who became an animator. So I don't know how that happened, but my dad didn't know that would happen. Um, this is my family. Here's me with my grandparents. This is my favorite um, dessert, which was uh, invented in Hong Kong. It's called the Dan Tat. It's a Chinese egg tart. There is no good egg tart in Philly. You have to get it. Like, I think the closest is probably New York. Come to New York. Yes. Um, so I went to UC Berkeley, and I majored in art. And as a consolation prize to my family, I majored in architecture. And that's where I discovered that um, I do not want to be an architect. And um, so I just, I was working like, random jobs and like making my art as a painter. And then at a certain point, I found my way to animation. And um, so I went to University of Southern California in Los Angeles, and I got my master's in animation. Um, and that kind of led me down a path that I had no idea was so awesome and exciting and diverse with like so many different ways you can go. So one of the questions that I think a lot of people want to know is, you know, OK, you finish your like MFA or you finish school. Now what? How do you get your first job? So we talked about this. This is like a common experience. And like, you know, 
even decades later, people are like, how do I get my next job? Um, but the answer is usually word of mouth. So be nice to everybody. Um, so after I finished with grad school, um, I was working some random freelance jobs like and um, one of the freelance jobs was to fabricate um, putting like tiny mirrors on foam. And I did that for like 10 hours with some people until like two in the morning. And then a week later, one of the people I was working on the project with said, hey, do you wanna work at this studio? So that kind of got my foot in the door to this, to this studio called Shadow Machine where I worked on the first season of BoJack Horseman and I was working in the studio for about a year and um, I was having a lot of fun. And then my husband um, got into UPenn and so we moved to Philly. Um, and so from Philly, I have been um, freelancing, doing some like visual essay type of stuff for the Atlantic and the ACLU, again, through some of my contacts from grad school. Um, randomly, I was um, like, so what really kept me here in Philly was that I, uh, had the opportunity to become the chair of animation at PAFA and launch their program and design the curriculum. And that was a really exciting journey full of many surprises, to say the least. Um, and during my time at, while I was a chair at PAFA, I also had the opportunity to do a major commission for a, um, for a composer. So I have that up here. Um, so this is kind of just a, you know, broad stroke of the types of things I do in animation, which are teaching as well as um, doing directorial commissions and also like various freelance work that comes my way um, and so here's my id during my first week she's at real Alpha. yeah <laughs> um, and this is just also another cross-section of um, what my life is in philadelphia and in the art world so i'm also active in the art community in Philadelphia, which I discovered is an amazing place for artists. Um, so coming from LA, I just found it so refreshing and accessible and, you know, so many cool people, everyone knows each other. Um, I'm a member of Tiger Strikes Asteroid, which has its gallery in the Crane Arts Building. Um, and also, I am one of the founders of the Animation Ensemble, which is a an open group of experimental animators and people who see animation as a fine art. Um, so by open group, like we put out, you know, an opportunity every year and it's usually um, an exquisite corpse and we just take a cross section of Philadelphia, like what, what are Philadelphia animators making? Um, and this, when we had the opportunity to project one of those collaborations on the wall of the PAFA Museum. Um, I'm also still painting and I see myself as an artist, I think animation is an art form. Um, and I'm working on experimental animation about um, lantern flies and seeing that as a metaphor for xenophobia and thinking about the immigrant experience um, using the language of chinoiserie. So here's an example here, down here of an animation test. And then up above is a, an example of some of the objects that I made in making the, in, um, making the film. So I've had the opportunity to be in like gallery world as well as indie animation and um, and yeah I think that leads leads us to Mariel. Hello uh, my name is Mariel Kinuko Cartwright. I'm a artist and animator in games. Um, I have some photos up here <laughs> of my background. Um, I'm, I'm half Japanese and half white. My mother is Japanese and my dad is white. Um, so I have a photo of me as a kid there in Japan. Um, I grew up in Los Angeles with a couple of years in the Bay Area, um, but my family would go you know, to Japan in the summer. And as a kid, I was obsessed with Sonic. Um, so I have a couple of my Sonic drawings here. That expression I'm making there is me trying to be Sonic. Um, so, so I kind of grew up, uh, I, I got very lucky. My dad uh, was a Disney animator um, and then my mom, being Japanese, we kind of had uh, a lot of that culture in the house, obviously. So I actually got lucky in that I grew up in an environment where art and animation was just our life. Um, so I uh, got a Genesis, a Sega Genesis when I was six, and from there just obsessed with video games. Um, I did differ a little bit from my dad in that I never really wanted to go into like 
film or TV. Um, in my teens, I really wanted to work in comics. Um, but then from there, I kind of realized like, well, if I do go to school for animation, I could probably learn a little bit of everything. You know, I can learn how to do comics, I can learn how to animate, I can learn how to composite. Um, and I just thought like, well, you know, animation sounds good to just get me a large range of skills. Um, so I went to CalArts and got a, a degree in character animation. And uh, since then, I, I started freelancing right out of school, actually while I was in school. Um, kind of like the last year of school, I started freelancing. Um, and from freelancing, I, I started getting studio jobs. Uh, and I've just had this like kind of crazy journey in games, but bouncing between different studios, freelancing the entire time. Um, I can, I have the clicker. Um, and I just, that's a photo of my family. I just threw that in there. <laughs> um, how do I go? That's backwards. How do I go forwards? The little arrow. This one? I clicked the wrong arrow. Okay, here we go. Um, yeah, so just, just a couple titles I've worked on. Um, Scott Pilgrim was the game I started working on as a freelancer while I was in school. Um, and my school experience was kind of mixed, honestly, because at the time, all of my fellow students really wanted to work for Disney or Pixar, Cartoon Network, you know, all these big studios. And there wasn't really a path forward to work in games. It just wasn't really like thought about that much. We had a 2D track or a 3D track. Um, but they were all kind of like, everyone just wanted to work in film or TV. So I feel like I kind of had to pave my own way to like apply my skills to, to work in games because I had this thought like, you know, oh, I'm learning all these skills, but I'm really passionate about games. I really want to work in games. Um, so from kind of like posting my art online, I kind of started getting some contacts in the game industry. Um, and then during my last year of school, I started working on the Scott Pilgrim game, which was being um, the, the lead animator was a friend of mine. Um, so I was working on Scott Pilgrim during my last year of school and I got to my like final like graduation review and they actually told me, um, we don't think you're ready to graduate yet because we don't think you'll be able to find work. And I was telling them like, I'm working for Ubisoft right now. Like I'm, I'm working, like I'm already working. Um, and I actually had to have one of my animation teachers, his name is Ted T. Um, he, he went to the rest of the faculty and, and fought for me basically. And so they let me out of school. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was, it was kind of weird and I kind of had to like find my own way. Um, but from there, I developed a relationship with a studio called Way Forward that I still work with today. Um, I worked on a game called Till Morning's Light. I also worked on like a lot of like Barbie or Batman, just kind of like a lot of licensed games with them. Um, early on, I also started working with a friend um, on a game called Skullgirls, which is still uh, happening today. Um, and I became lead animator on that just because I kind of asked like, hey, you know, it, it was just like an indie thing with we'll a bunch of friends like working together. And as we finally started realizing, oh, this is a real thing, we have money, you know, we can, um, there's, there's a studio that's going to hire us. Um, I said to my friend, you know, there's no lead animator. Can I just be the lead animator? Like, I think I could do it. Um, and from there, I kind of was able to, to start directing the animation. I was able to get people together, organize things, find better pipelines for, for the way we work. Um, so we worked on Skullgirls for several years. And after that, I was a creative director on a game called Indivisible, um, which came out to like mixed reviews. It was kind of like a very tumultuous project, um, but I'm still really proud of the work we did. Um, and then since then, I've just kind of like freelanced. Um, there's a game called Penny's Big Breakaway that came out earlier this year that I did cutscenes for. Um, totally, like, not exactly game development, but there's, like, a YouTube series called Tales Tube that I do, like, the compositing for. Uh, what do I have behind me? I'm doing 3D work on a game called Demon School that's coming out. Um, and I'm also do, doing, like, doing a animation and directing the whole project for Clock Tower, which is a game um, that was released in Japan in the 90s that we're finally releasing to the West for the first time. So I really kind of bounce around between a 
ton of different studios, just kind of like leaning on the connections I have and just kind of poking my head in, being like, hey, do you need help? I can help. Um, so that's kind of been my journey um, in game development. And did I do it right? Apparently, I don't know how to do this. Where do we? <laughs> There he goes, yay! Um, <laughs> um, and yeah, in, in my own time, um, I do personal work, so this is kind of an example of my own style. I love doing like black and white imagery. Um, I'm not like a great painter, um, so I do less color work, um, but I, I really love to do like black and white, kind of leaning on inks and just kind of like fun line texture and stuff. Um, so I haven't been able to do as much personal uh, work the past year or so because I've been freelancing so much. Um, but when I have the time, this is the kind of the kind of work that I like to produce. Um, and I think I think that sums it up. Hey, hello. Thank you. <laughs> Let me see if I can make this work. Oh, <laughs> apparently I did it too much. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Shell. Hi. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here because also meeting these two, we have really different career paths. I actually, um, I'm the example where I did not go to school to do what I do right now. Um, very interesting. And then my career has been, um, also didn't grow up in the family being with artists. Um, so I'm just going to go down to the, walk down the history lane with me, you know, Mary Lane with me. So um, I am originally uh, from Taiwan. I was born and raised there uh, until I finished high school and I came to Philly for Temple. Um, and my, uh, when I was growing up, I, I'm i that out extrovert, Helen, it's kind of like you, like, uh, I, I, I go out, I was actually in the choir um, that we go out and travel a lot in the different countries. I lived between, I turned 18, I went to so many different countries and that was that extrovert of talking to strangers on the street. Because people walk and be like, what are you here? And a bunch of Asians like running around like seeing and stuff. And I'll have to explain what we, who we are, what we do. Um, and so, but then I never really knew what I wanted to do. High school, I actually studied science. So completely not liberal arts, like nothing about arts related. I also hated history, don't tell my teacher. Um, but then when I came to Temple, actually I was torn between biochemistry and film. And when I made the decision going to the, the second one, my parents just went, what? Um, but they're more hands off. My, they're, my dad was travel, so it's, they're more like hands off in, in terms of do whatever you want to do, we're here to support you. Um, so in that sense, I feel really, really lucky. But back then I was doing video editing. Uh, my dream job was to be a video editor for documentaries where I don't have to talk to anyone. I literally just lock myself in the dark room where I don't have to give me all the footage. I'll figure out the story um, and look at me now. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, so, but then I went to SVA for graduate school and before I went there, I already had a whole idea of my film, which is about this lovely woman, my grandmother right there. Um, I, she had an interesting uh, life journey, went from China to Taiwan, ended up living in Nebraska in the middle of nowhere, not speaking English, working, quote uncle working in my uncle's restaurant, talking to Americans in Chinese and somehow they could communicate. It was just so amazing to me that I started just shooting, I just put her in front of the camera and that generation, I have no idea what I was doing. So she was just talking constantly. And so she became a really important part of my life where I was just stalking her everywhere she went <laughs> with the camera to the point everyone thought I was crazy. Uh, but then I got my entire family start documenting her as well. So we have so much footage. So that became my thesis. But while I was in grad school, again, this is where I have no career trajectory. Um, while I was in grad school, the second semester, the faculty walk up to me like, you want to work? Do you want a job? I was like, sure. I have no idea what it was. I became a production assistant for motion capture. No experience in 3D. I don't know anything about Maya. Uh, I just said yes. And then got thrown into the fire. I think we also learned a lot on the job too, as much as we are trained to do certain things. 
I became the uh, the IT for production houses, for especially for mocap. I will be on the call with Autodesk to fix flame suites on terminal. Does that make does that make sense to any of you? Maybe some of you. <laughs> Basically, just coding. And so I talked, to, but that was kind of my dream job, right? I was working with computers. I didn't have to talk to anyone. Um, but then fast forward, I uh, so that's that. Oh, that's the mocap, and you will see that photo again. I have a story about that, and then. On the side, I started to doing a lot of documentaries and short films, especially in fashion. So that's kind of my creative side of it. And then, huh. hey, oh, okay, good, okay. Um, then kind of fast, my career kind of fast tracked in terms of I start working in higher education and um, start teaching and become a staff uh, and an admin staff. And I start going to a lot of conferences and festivals. So this is where I always tell the story that animation adopted me. I never chose it. I actually don't know how to draw. I'm happy to admit that. Um, but I animation adopted me in the way that at all the conferences I went to, all the recruiters and all the hiring managers I met, they kind of took me under their wings and just start talking to people. And then I start building my network. And this is actually the amazing part about all industry, actually just human interaction is everyone you meet, it's they will stay in your life and they will turn into something else if you allow it to be and you want to continue that relationship. So um, I then be, I got appointed to become the chair for BFA animation at School of Visual Arts about four and a half, five years ago. Uh, being a chair, a lot of interesting is an understatement in terms of what that job is. I'm sure Steven's like in the back nodding right now. Um, so I went from wanting to be an editor, not talking to anyone, where now I have 440 students specializing in 2D animation. Yeah, the entire more is my, student, my entire department. Uh, and I tell the story this morning that if my, if I know a student's name and what you look like, it's either for a really good reason or really bad reason. <laughs> Hopefully the good ones. Um, so since uh, I would say my career kind of went on a fast track in terms of going around the world to uh, do different talks. So this literally last year I went to places I never thought I would go. I just got back from Mexico. I was in Kosovo. I was in Ecuador. I didn't know Ecuador is on the equator line. I know that's in the name, but I didn't know until I got there. Um, so I get invited to different festivals for sometimes for being a judge, uh, sometimes to, to do a talk on master classes, especially I position myself at kind of intersection between animation and, and education. Um, really fortunate. I also do a lot of panels in Annecy in South of France. So yeah, these are some of so yeah, th that photo is freshman class. 120 students right there. So yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. Um, but then this other great, thank you. Uh, so then I while I when I got appointed to become the chair for SVA, um, the we uh, Vice President Jinko Goto, she's an executive producer for all the Lego movies and Little Prince and also Klaus. She reached out to me and wine and dined me to the point that she lured me to be on the board. Uh, but prior to that, actually, that's a story I should share. So I threw that photo back of me in the mocap suit. Um, so with, uh, 2013, I went to a conference in Stuttgart. Uh, called FMX and specialized in computer uh, graphics. Uh, there was a panel about women in animation. They have uh, animator, recruiters, and research and educator talking about their experience. Me sitting in the audience, I was like, mm, I don't know what they're talking about. I know one of the panelists. She's my friend. I'm going to go and support. At the end of the talk, my boss at the time asked me, well, he didn't ask me. He just presented to me and said, hey, if you want to join WIA, fully support you, you being a woman. And literally, my response was like, Pfft. I don't know what that means um, because I didn't feel related to it. I grew up with two sisters and my grandmother, just a lot of women in my in my family that I didn't really see gender. I know it sounds weird, but that's really how I grew up. So all the problems you're talking about, I couldn't really relate. But then until I went back to school, um, my classroom and start seeing people in my classrooms and then start seeing all the people I'm hiring, all men. 
and the, all the other people doing talks are all men. I was like, oh no, I gotta do something about it. Um, so this is kind of how we uh, got, I got into WIA as a member and then 2016, I became the co-lead along with Deb Stone. She's now the recruiter at Illumination as well as Mark Osborne, the director for Little Friends. The three of us revamped the New York City chapter. Then 2019 is when I joined the board. So this is just wanna show a little bit of, I know everyone have creative projects. This is my creative projects uh, in, in skateboarding. So, um, so I do a lot of things um, on, on WIA. I'm completely a volunteer. I don't get paid. I do a lot of programming, including the scholarship program, as well as the student collective, and a lot of different things that I do in terms of just help and support underrepresented gender identities, not only into the industry, but also go up to the higher ladder because for the industry to change, we need top down. We need all the decision makers. So um, there's a lot of things that I do. So this is kind of my career path to share with everyone. I'm gonna, hey, 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 oh, all right. So this is the three of us and we're really happy to be here. Um, so I guess we'll, maybe we'll, we, we actually chatted so much to the point where like we should stop talking because we need to chat on stage. <laughs> uh, maybe the first, you know, we're gonna talk about is what animation means to us. Amy, you wanna kick off with that? Well, my students have heard this many times, but to me, animation is like, there's no way to define it except for its sequential images. Um, and for me in my practice, it's an intersection of the fine arts, independent filmmaking and the industry. And that's a, that's a Venn diagram that I, I float between. Um, I think for me, it's, it's about storytelling. You know, I think every, every image you're creating is telling a story. I think animation is such an amazing intersection of all these different disciplines um, that, that, you know, like being able to, to create an animation start to finish requires so many different skills. Um, and then in the end, I think you're, you're creating a story, you're expressing yourself. Um, and I think that's something so unique to it that I, I'm not sure that like other disciplines have it in just the same way. Um, so I think that's why I'm so drawn to animation because there's so much that goes into it. And then I think there's so much that people get out of it as well. Yeah, I agree also just the story part of it, um, but I came from more film background. Um, so I, like the general public when I, you know, I used to watch cartoons, I watched Doraemon, that's my favorite, that it, I can choose a character, be my best friend, that will be the cat, you know, you know who that is, right? Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> um, and, but then I think because I say animation adopted me, I never really thought that's a career or I can actually help people in that career is really literally the people that I met, uh, what, how they define animation is actually all the people because it's such a collaborative uh, effort of making something work. There's definitely some, there's magic to it that you cannot cre recreate with humans, right? This is such a fantastical world, but I always still think that animation still um, uh, came out of the live action in terms of human. There's emotions embedded that, you know, go back to the live action and watch people, how they interact, because that's also can come, and come into the animation. Uh, but I think I, for me, animation, there's also that people side of it that's drawn me into it. Um, actually, I'm going to really ask this question also, especially, you know, the topic of being Asian American, you know, how, how does that for you? I know I'm throwing a curveball question right now, because I feel like we should touch on this topic a little bit is just our career in terms of being Asian American, uh, especially in your own role. Yeah. Um, so. I haven't thought deeply about this question before. Um, like, well, I have, yes, I have, but, but like, you know, I, I wasn't fully prepared for this question just now, but I, I will share a couple anecdotes. Um, one was that in grad school, I, like, we had an Asian American director come speak to us who was super well known for a show that he had created, and there was like major fans in the crowd. And I, I had not grown up with MTV, so I was not like, fan struck and I just casually asked like having gone to Berkeley like talking about identity was you know that you do that in every single class it's it's okay we're here for discussions and so I casually asked 
you know, if as an Asian American, do you find that it's any kind of like you have a you're in a position of power? Do you feel that, you know, you have like agency to change the stereotypes about Asian Americans? Like they're really good at math, they're like good at kung fu, blah blah blah. And he just said, I don't think that's an interesting question. I think that is just not interesting because I focus on universal issues and I'm interested in human stories and I include Asians only when it is like story appropriate. And I was like, okay, have a nice day. Um, so I didn't realize that I had set off this entire like back and forth dialogue on um, our seminar blog where I was called racist and regressive and I was like, whoa, everyone's got issues. And that kind of um, really followed me up until now because it's such a, you know, no one would say that now. Um, so, so anyway, that's something I have thought about. And um, another anecdote is that I went to an animation conference, I'm more on the academic side, and um, I gave a talk on animation, the avant-garde, and this, after the talk, like this person was like drunk, who's, she was Korean, and she was like, oh my gosh, you, you talk about smart things, like, oh my gosh, it's so good to see an Asian woman talking about the smart things. I was like, whoa, <laughs> what? I, I don't, I, I actually don't think about myself like in that context of like, you know, you're thinking about yourself as a human, but then sometimes you sit there in the studio and you're like, oh, I might be like one of the only Asian people in this room. Um, and then this is the last story, which I, I'll stop after this, but it was pretty funny. Like there was a row of us sitting in um, Shadow Machine and I don't know why they didn't do this on purpose, but it was like, three out of the four Asian women in the studio of like 100 people were sitting in the same row. And then next to me was my wonderful friend who I love dearly, who's like a tall white man. And he was the director. And um, he was like, guys, I've always wanted to animate my friends into the show. I, let's do that for this show. And I was like, this show is called Karma Spa. And it's about a bunch of Asian women torturing like two dudes who came in. Like, <laughs> I, like like, I, let, how about not this one? <laughs> but I mean, I just thought that was funny. Like, you know, being in the animation industry, like, and in the studio I was in, there was a lot of like uncomfortable material. And so that might be one example of that. But I'll stop talking, let my panelists speak on this. Um, yeah, so I have, um, I think this is a pretty common experience for, for biracial kids where I think you, you really don't belong in one or the other. And I think that's, that's something that I feel like, even today, I struggle with a little bit, where it's like, to white people, I'm Asian. To, to Japanese people, I'm white. I don't belong in one or the other. Um, and I think I also struggled in, in that, you know, I grew up in LA. My Japanese is conversational. Honestly, I'm like still studying. Um, and, you know, so I had that experience of like not even being able to talk fully with like my own family, like in Japan. Uh, my mother is from Japan. Um, she, she came to the US after meeting my dad working, he was working in Japan at the time. Um, and they came back to the US in, I guess the eighties. Um, so, so she immigrated here. Um, but I think she, my mother really wanted to learn English. Um, so we spoke English at home. And so, you know, my Japanese is really only conversational. Um, and, and just, yeah, growing up, I, I never felt like I was good enough. You know, I wasn't a good Japanese person. I wasn't a good white, that's really weird to say. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think, I think even today, I struggle to articulate, like, I am Asian. I'm also white. I feel more Asian. I would never identify as white, but I do identify as Asian American. Um, so it's, it's something that, when it comes back to art, you know, I, I think it comes out in that like, my style is obviously anime inspired, you know, I kind of bring some of that influence in. But even still, I, I will hear sometimes like, she looks like she's copying anime, she looks like she's trying to be Japanese. And it's like, what does that mean? Like, I, I am Japanese, I guess, like, you know, so it's really been kind of like a weird experience growing up. And I think again, it's so common, I think, with biracial or multiracial kids where it's like you just don't really belong anywhere. Um, 
and I don't know what the solution is. <laughs> I think it's it's just part of that struggle of like existing. Um, so I don't know what the moral is. I don't know if I have a good like resolution to that story, but that's kind of been my experience being a Japanese American artist. And I think in my case, I moved here when I was 18. Um, when uh, my student Asian American Student Union reached out to me to be their faculty advisor, I actually sat them down and said, I'm mean, totally honest, I was like, I don't think to myself as Asian American. I do have American passport. I, you know, I came here and got a test and everything. So it's, it's, it's actually the struggle that, I, that you're talking about. It's also for me, it's like, I, I know people see this as Asian American, especially I don't have a strong accent. My accent comes out when I'm drunk. Um, so, um, so I think my struggle that I can relate is in that sense, especially also English, not my first language. Um, I remember when I freshman year at Temple, one of my friend Taiwanese is an architect major. He's like, oh, we're gonna go site visit. You wanna come? I was like, sure, thinking all gonna be new friends, right? Uh, at the end of the day, he came to me and said, you're so rude, you didn't talk to my friends. And this is what I said to him. I have to understand what they're saying first before I can even have a conversation. I'm still being, you know, absorbing. Um, and for me, it's, it's, the, the moment I realized I can eavesdrop in the subway and listen to podcasts without caption and understanding what people are talking about is, uh, it's like, oh, I can understand English. This is amazing. Um, and I think for me, being Asian, especially, you know, I was not born and raised here. I always still struggle. I actually met my first boss and my first internship in my life was in Philadelphia. I actually met the guy, the owner today. Before I came here, um, I haven't seen him since, what, 2006 or something. Uh, he's older. He has way more gray hair. I look great. Uh, <laughs> um, but it, I was just literally telling him the story that my biggest fear at the time, some actually even now, is ordering sandwiches in deli because there's no menus. You just have to know what you want and you walk up the counter, you tell them what you want. Like for me, not growing up here, not knowing the options of what type of bread there are. Total. It's it's a it's a it's a horror for me. Um, but then going back to the career is also the story I can share is when before I applied for the position of becoming the chair of the department, I actually didn't want to apply. A lot of my friends reach out and say, You do everything that job description, you should go for it. And my response I'm not kidding, I'm not exaggerating. And this is what I said, I don't look like any of them. I don't, I even in chairs meeting now, I don't look like, I mean, we have a lot more women chairs now, uh, but majority of my peers are, no offense to Stephen and Chris, uh, <laughs> they're all white men, right? So, and then I still find, that I would just be totally honest, the struggles are real and still happening now that I have to constantly fight I think we still do in all work environment is just we have to speak up and because because people treat other people a certain way and I think sometimes it just takes as a communication and hopefully not leading into the confrontation but sometimes letting them know that we are different and you can treat me or I hope you can treat me this way because we should all respect each other especially back to the industry this industry is incredibly small apparently you went to the high school with Amy's friend? Yes, yes. I just like... found out yesterday. My visiting artist was like, oh, I know Muriel. I went to high school in CalArts with her. So yeah, small world. Be nice to people. People talk, really. Especially recruiters talk to each other. It's insane. Um, so I guess we'll next talk a little bit. I'm gonna thank you for letting me throw this curveball question. I, I think it's really important to talk about like, the struggles are real as much as, Especially if you see people on stage, you're like, oh my God, they got their lives figured it out. No, we don't. <laughs> uh, we're still in it. We still are, you know, figuring it out. Yeah, but I think, I think, you know, if there's something that you can take away from this, it's like, if you have these feelings, you're not alone. I think even now we're still experiencing some of these kind of like, you know, nervous, anxious, apprehension, you know, you don't really know what to do. It's like, we're still experiencing that. If you experience that as well, it's not just you, it's just part of this experience of living and, and you know, 
identifying as as a woman or a marginalized gender like it's or, or you know whatever whatever ethnicity you are it's all just part of it and you're not alone and also finding that allies who who people can understand it may not necessarily understand i think that's a big word but be there to help you and advocate for you uh because i think it does take all of us together to make that change happen in terms of the industry in terms of how people should treat each other right especially you know the salary discrepancy uh or people see you know there's always the stories that they don't let women talk in the meetings does that happen now unfortunately yes but in that situation speak up or if you're the ally make sure you i literally was in the meeting a couple days ago with two filmmakers from costa rica they're going to go to annecy and pitch when we asked a question about hey um what kind of changes have you made since we saw your pitch the male filmmaker was very explaining everything and i let him talk but at the end of the call i said if i can make a big suggestion about your pitch is you need to share that workload equally and since i said that every time other questions were asked he would make sure that hey daniela can you talk about your view as well so i think it's about listening and also kind of help each other in the end of yeah and i mean i think beyond being asian american like the thing that i felt a lot in the studio i mean i, I think that the studio I was at was very, it was well known for Robot Chicken, which is, um, you know, it's kind of dirty, silly college humor, but there was a lot of like, like, very like male humor in this show. And like a lot of like, I, I found myself like, okay, well, what do, what do potheads like, like what, what would be in their room? And I'd like be drawing pictures of what I thought that like, college boys wanted to look at or like you know I don't know like I was like I like Barbarella Jane Fonda's really hot I'm gonna draw a Barbarella poster but um I felt this boys club and I mean I don't know why but I was in the compositing floor and like there's only three women or something and I just felt like the energy was like very uh felt very aggressive and my personality is more like I'm a little softer and you know I, I'm like a cat like I'll approach if I feel safe and I just, you know, I, I wouldn't, but I loved my experience there. Like I did, I loved being at that studio and being in that energy and being part of a group. Like what both of the other panels were saying about collaboration, I love that about animation. And I feel like you find your people in the studio. So me and the production coordinator became really good friends and we went on to co-direct projects together. And um, yeah, we're lifelong friends and I feel like the one of the producers at the studio is super awesome and you know i you know i dream of like maybe pitching something with the two of them like let's try to change the industry and i think that there is a desire for more voices um yeah and, and i feel like it's a good time to put ideas out there so i feel like what i would suggest like let's make some stories that people want to watch and start changing the culture because like, I don't, I was like, why do people think that we want to watch this terrible humor? Like, nobody is laughing, like, not even the target audience. So let's, let's make some good stories. Be real. Um, so we're going to shift the question about the work uh, a little bit in terms of being in the industry. Uh, Meryl, how do you balance your own style versus the studio style? Um, good question. I guess it's not, it's not necessarily a balance that I'm consciously choosing, but I mean, when I'm doing work, like I work on a lot of projects in very different styles, like again, Barbie, Batman, uh, Sonic, you know, anime inspired stuff. Um, and I think, you know, having like being able to work in those different styles has kind of gotten me to where I am. Um, so when I'm not working, that's when I just kind of do whatever I want. And that's when my own art, um, you know, comes out. So I, I think it's like, I'm not consciously choosing a balance. I'm just like doing the job and then doing whatever I want, <laughs> you know? Um, so I think that's kind of how it manifests for me. We also talk about while you're in school, you're really want to find oh, your yeah. own style, right? Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of you, like, I, I, I am really, I like the style, I'm really perfecting it. Um, but then the industry 
might not be the same style and how do you I mean you also teach do you see that in your classroom yeah I think style is kind of a tricky subject I mean coming from a fine arts background if you had a style then you know people would ask you well what what is style like why don't you approach the idea first and then the style will come out naturally and in illustration and animation I think um, style can also be tricky because, you know, if you have a really strong style, then people might think that that's all you can do. So, um, and I also grew up close to Art Center and taking classes there. And one thing that I, I noticed that students could do was that they could do anything, like they could emulate anything. It's like, oh, make a Paul Rand inspired poster. Okay, make a like, you know, modern poster for this or design this style. and. I was really fascinated by this chameleon way that people could move through things. And when I started in the industry, I felt that pressure that, that I should be able to be a chameleon too. Um, and I was asked to like illustrate in certain styles. And I found it like, I found this pressure like, oh, I should really learn how to do that. And then once I stepped away from the industry, I, was, I thought, oh, well, you know, that was really good skill building, but that's getting me further away from who I think I am as an artist. Um, and so, and I also noticed that I have two different styles which are very like strange to me to bridge where I do like a commissioned work, it's more um, less realistic. And then in my personal work, it's, it's, um, it's like a little more like ha handmade. Um, I don't know how to describe that. But, um, but yeah, I think that if you have, you follow your personal vision, then that leads um, people to hire you to be a director. So I think you have to think also, do you want to be a director or do you want to be, do you want to be directed? So if you want to be the director, I think you should definitely, you know, develop your own style. But, you know, it, it's really fun to support other people. So the more you can do, the more opportunities will be out there. Yeah, I was going to add, um, I, I remember being really fixated on just like what, what is my style? Like, you know, I, I, I want to understand, like, how do I make something look like it's from me? And I think, you know, even now I feel like, you know, it's constantly evolving. I'll, I'll see something like, oh, I love this, the way this person draws noses. I kind of want to emulate that a little bit. So it's like, my style is just an amalgamation of like everything I've seen. Um, and so it's, it's not really something that like, I'm consciously like, this is my style. This is what I'm going to do. It's just a reflection of like what I've taken in recently. Um, and I think it, you know, framing it that way, like hopefully kind of like, you know, makes it so you don't have to be so anxious about it like I was. Um, but, you know, it's, it's always evolving. And I think, you know, when you work in uh, like on projects like I have, like a lot of licensed or like very specific styles, it's like, you know, you're, you're just taking in what's out there and reflecting it back you know, in a specific way. Um, so that's kind of like how I came to terms with like, I'm not worrying about what my style is. I'm just expressing, you know, what comes to me. Um, and for me, do you know a video game called Katamari? Okay, cool. I love it. Uh, and I feel like every person, every single person, you like that. Okay, so sorry, I should explain for those of you that don't know. Uh, you started, you're like a little character, you start like rolling a ball and the, then the one, so you start with a small ball so you can roll up smaller things. As the ball is getting bigger, you can roll up bigger items and became, you can roll up buildings, you can roll up planets at the end. When I was obsessed with the game, every time I walked on the street, I was like, I'm gonna do that and we're gonna do that one because it gets bigger and bigger. Um, and for me, that's actually how I see every single person is, is that you are the collection of all your experience and everything you see, everyone you meet, every, things you like and don't like, it all becomes who you are. Um, so I think it's it's interesting to want it to have one voice. Um, and I think it's it would be great to kind of expand that a little bit that you could do a lot of different things. And then at, when the opportunity comes, become a director and then uh, empower that and then, you know, make that enlarge and make that bigger too. But I think as a you know, early career, you're rolling maybe smaller to medium sized objects and do a lot of them because, um, and I will say that I know you all love animation. I love, love car cartoons. 
Um, but branch out to see other medium, especially fine arts. It's a great way. We're talking about the textile museum that have a really amazing exhibition now. Try different things. Essentially, they're all storytelling. They all have a concept and how the concept transpire from one medium to another. I think that's really, really fun. So in terms of style, I, I, I always want to tell my students that it's great to have your own style, but it's also important to be able to adapt uh, because you don't know what the adaptation, the process also could help you be more having your own style or not, right? It's all part of the process. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I see in terms of the style. You know, oh, you know, so going back to what we we're talking about, uh, Amy has a different, you know, style in the fine arts and, you know, working industry and also everyone, we're all busy doing a lot of different things. Um, just going to talk about like work-life balance between your career and family and all this stuff. Who wants to start? Hmm? Someone's giggling. Who want to start? <laughs> I don't at the same time I want to say at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say I don't have work life balance. Oh, okay. So um, that's that's a constant struggle. I think um, I, I still honestly, this is something I've really struggled with the past couple of years where I still have that like freelancer hustler mentality where I'm like every second I'm not working. I'm not making money. You know, I need to I need to live, you know, um, so I think I think that's something like that's why my output of like personal art has actually decreased a lot in the past couple of years, because for some reason I've just kind of like picked up like keep working, keep working, keep working. Um, and I'm I'm closer to 40 than I am to 30 now. And I'm like, I got to get over this. Um, but, you know, it's it's still a struggle. I and mean, I think, you know, this year I'm really trying to be like, OK, let's kind of wind down some of the freelance work. Let's be OK with maybe not making as much as I did last year um, and actually kind of like find what inspires me again. Let's let's play some games. Let's watch some movies, um, because I think even even at this point in my life, I'm like, have I gone off course a little bit? Like, let's try to find our way back. Um, so I think, you know, it's it's a struggle. Maybe you'll kind of like find your way forward and maybe you'll fall off a little bit. Um, but, you know, I, I obviously I think like having a work life balance is, is super important because if you're not engaging in things that inspire you, you know, what are you doing? You're, you're just kind of like just working and going to sleep. Uh, you know, I scroll a lot of like TikTok and then I fall asleep. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, if you fall off, find your way back. And that's kind of where I'm at right now. Yeah, I think that's some good advice is to sort of take a break and look back like, is this worth it? But um, I'm, I'm not sure what to say. I don't know if I would say it's balanced or not. I think it's really hard to say like, what's work-life balance? Because what if the thing that people do when they're not making money is making art? And then what if your art is your work? And then what if your art is one of the most important things to you besides family? So then that means that um, I, any time that I have that's spare, like I'm trying to make my own work and I get most of that done like at between nine and midnight because, um, you know, I have a family and your relationships are really important. So I would say I probably sleep less than I would like to, but I, I'm happy that I managed to have a career where I'm getting a paycheck, but then I'm also making my art loan work, artwork, which big surprise, I'm actually getting money for it recently. I don't know how that happened, but um, but yeah, if you are sincere to your work, like, and it's not it's not like if you work really hard, then you then you get the pot of gold, but you know, but then you're ready for when the leprechaun comes. So I think that like I started to stress for a little for there was a time when I thought, oh my gosh, like I need to be getting like a show or whatever, but I was wasting time like I should have been making the work so that when the opportunity arises, then you're ready. Um, but yeah, in terms of work life balance, I think that I definitely I, I make sure that the weekends are for my family. So I would say that that is more balanced than, than some people that I've heard of. Like there was, you know, I've heard about people getting like multiple divorces because they can't, um, they can't prioritize their family and I would never want to be that person. So 
But Amy, question for you though. So did you, before you have, I mean, you got married, was this something that in, in your mind already about the work-life balance or because you got married? I'm just curious. Um, well, I, I don't want to say it's because um, of my upbringing, but my, like, it's a very common story that your Asian parents, especially if they're immigrants, I would say immigrant parents really are workaholics because they came here. They're like, why did I come here? I have to work really hard to support my family and so that they'll become doctors. And um, so then I just, you know, grew up seeing my dad working all the time and he would come home and then work until 10. And then, you know, I thought that was normal. So then I kept doing that and, and now I do it. So. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's good to find a book and just, you know, just read at night. I realize the three of us are the bad examples and there is no part of my family. We did not coordinate this. Um, I completely agree with everything you both said. I realize I am where I am with my career because I haven't said no to any opportunities. Anything people will like me to help out, I always say yes. I did say yes. I did say no to Jinko actually when she lured me to the board. I said no. I just started a new job. Uh, I can't figure out for you because the the former chair of education, his name is Brendan Birch. He's a, a founder of Six Point Harness. They uh, that did Hair Love. I'm sure you know that short film. Um, and his struggle was more that he's a white man going to conferences, meeting all the young emerging talent like you want to join the nonprofit for underrepresented gender identities, especially for women. So that's why they asked me to kind of take over. But then I did say no, but then she promised me all the things in the world to help me out. Um, yeah, I even during pandemic, uh, I'm sure a lot of educators can relate to um, that I will work from 6am to midnight nonstop, just because I had to figure out classes for my students, and I need to make sure um, you know, I provide all the resources there that are needed. Um, I, I, but I will say this year for sure, starting last year, um, I am in my career where I recognize that is not healthy. Um, I'm constantly on the go of going somewhere. I mean, I still, I still do that, but I always make sure that wherever I go, I will spend one extra day to actually meet people because that's what I love the most. Uh, in terms of animation or just in terms of life is meeting people. I want to make sure that I'm not like Sonic the Hedgehog, just like, chuk, 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 I don't do that. Uh, even though it's really cool, but I feel like it's, I need to take that moment. So I start, I start doing something that you should not be doing. We talk about it. It's called extreme sports, um, <laughs> especially for those of your creative artists. I start skateboarding uh, and doing pottery. I basically was forcing myself to get away from the screens. Uh, do pottery, don't do skateboarding. I don't want to hurt yourself. Uh, if you do, wear all the gears I, there are. Um, so I, I realized taking myself away from the screen and also whatever the problems that I was dealing with, because when you're skateboarding, the only thing I care about is not dying. <laughs> Literally for that hour, an hour and a half, that that's the only thing on my mind. Then I also feel like that's healthy for me than where whatever the problem I give back to it's a different perspective and I feel taking a break so again don't skateboard I don't know if that's not the takeaway today. Um, but really whatever the 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 other thing you choose to do. Um, like pottery for me it's actually really creative but i'm also trying to. I do wheels because I like structure and all these people I talked to in the studio they're like you need to do hand build. And I said, I can't, I need structure. Uh, so everyone's forcing me to do something that's different. And I think it's actually training my brain a little bit differently. So that's my work-life balance is force, force, sorry, sounds, sounds like workaholic, right? I was like forcing myself to do other things that's not in front of the computers and not, not that not creative, but not in my normal environment. Uh, and I think that's really been helping. Um, so yeah, that's the, so hopefully we share something. <laughs> uh, you know, it's important though, because I, I do think especially in the old group, there's a lot of work involved in terms of you can't get burned out. 
So with that said, you know, do you have any like supports or like resources in terms of just being in your, you know, in the industry in your career? Um, I'm not sure this is exactly answering the question, but I would say collaborating has been a really great way to move you forward because, you know, I was just talking to my friend the other day and she was describing that, you know, she really wanted to finish a film and she got a residency and she just worked by herself and just toiled away hours and hours and hours and hours and she said, wait, I don't have any friends. And um, you can be that person and make this work and then go to the festivals and maybe make friends, but I found that a way to motivate myself to grow um, is by bringing my friends into the studio um, and collaborating. And it's, you know, if you're a workaholic, then that's the best way to hang out with your friends. Are we invited, Are we invited to your studio? Of course. Yes. <laughs> Um, I would say don't be afraid to ask for help. Like actually lean on the people around you and ask them and reach out. Um, because I've, I've always been someone who has been like, I can handle it myself. I don't want to bother anyone. You know, I don't want to annoy anyone. Um, so I've gone a long time just kind of like having a very small circle of friends, just being fine with it. You know, I love my friends, of course. Um, but I feel like the past several years, I've tried to like push myself to actually reach out, um, find new communities. Like I'm, I'm now in like a bunch of discords for like various kind of like game dev groups um, and actually like not just spying on the discords, like actually talking and, and reaching out to people and asking questions. Um, and it turns out that when you ask a question, people are actually really happy to help you. Um, you're not bothering them. Um, you know, I, I think helping someone gives you kind of like that that rush of adrenaline of like, you know, like you're happy, like you want to help. And I think that's the case for most people. Um, even just the other day, like I, it, it went the other way where it's like someone asked me for help and I dropped everything because I was just excited to like be able to help them with something. So I think it goes both ways. Um, so I really think just don't be afraid to, to find new communities, to ask people for help, to lean on the people around you you're probably not bothering them and they are happy to talk to you. I agree. Can I just say that and end it? <laughs> um, no, I think also in terms of like my position, my, my, my work at WIA is also, there's a lot of nonprofit organizations out there. WIA is only one of them. There's Riza Animation, Black Animated, Latinx Animation. There's a lot of different organizations that provide the support and based on who you are and what you like to do. Um, so I think goes along with, you know, finding, I mean, you have this community right here. I also would love to know more about Amy's, like your, like the, the, the experimental animation within Philly. There's a lot of cool people doing cool things out there, it's, you know, finding the community, finding the people that share the same passion. But at the same time, I, I you know, I think sometimes people finding people that share the same passion, then you kind of went down the rabbit hole of like only looking at a certain things, but also encourage each other to kind of branch out to see something that's slightly different. Um, you know, uh, so that community building is really important. So the organizations out there, there's a lot of opportunities out there in terms of uh, mentorship opportunities, scholarships. Um, there's a lot of portfolio reviews out there. They're really run by professionals. There's a Access VFX for those of you who are interested in 3D, they do online portfolio reviews. So there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, and that's really accessible because now pretty much everything's done online. Uh, but again, back to work-life balance, don't burn yourself out, you know, making sure uh, you're not overextending yourself as well. So I think that's good. Steven, do you wanna ask some of the question that you have prepared? Turn on the microphone. Ooh. Okay, there we go. All right, so I have a list of questions here um, that I've gathered, and one of um, the top ones is, what is your best advice for networking for college students who are about to graduate and want to kind of break into whether it is the kind of gallery scene and fine art scene, festival scene, or the industry itself? And uh, are there places that you would recommend going to, just kind of adding on to your what you were talking about? 
You know, when I, I really don't like the idea of networking. It feels very sleazy to me. Um, and it, it feels, it makes me feel very uncomfortable. Like I want something from somebody. Um, but I discovered in Philly that what networking is, is just making friends, which is super, like super fun. Um, and you should go to the places that you enjoy and like get outside of, you know, your, your computer. And like, you know, sometimes I'm tempted just like, I need to work on my film. I'm just gonna go into my studio. But it's like, you, it's like you got into this because you love art. So go out and experience that. Um, I would say that, so most of my work contacts have been through people who I knew from school. And when people say, oh, do you need to go to animation school to get into animation? The answer is actually no, as Shang will tell you, but Shang got in because she made friends and she was a nice person. Um, I, I guess it's a, it's, <laughs> maybe it's hard if you're a shy person. Um, I, one of my friends who um, I met in the studios, she, she got her job by taking a class at the like, Concept Design Academy in Pasadena. So she was just taking an after hours class and just, you know, you're in a class, you meet the people next to you and, you know, you see each other every week. And then one day you hear that there's an internship. So, so that's how she got in. So I think just being in the places where there are other animators is um, how to get that job. Um, also, I don't know how, like the person who found me for the commission found me. She doesn't even know. Um, and it's really weird, like, and then someone found me for an art show last, like, earlier this year, and I said, how did you find me? And she said, I don't know. And I think that I must be on the internet. And, like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like I, you know, I have an Instagram account, I'm on, like, Papa's website, there's, like, a blurb, but um, this is really funny. Uh, my friend who came to visit yesterday, who knows Muriel, um, Giovanna, she was like, oh, Great women animators. I put you on there, Amy. I was like, what? That was you? Um, and I think that people have found me that way. So I guess my advice for you know getting out there is being in the place where the people who share your interests are and just you know being friendly. Um, and yeah, and just making your presence as, as broad as possible on the internet. Yeah, I, I would say the same. And I think networking if you approach networking like oh i have to i have this person i'm targeting and i want to find a way to get to that person like i feel like that's not a good way to approach it but i feel like the way i've gone about my whole career is like it turns into a like a friend of a friend situation where it's like maybe you know the person i'm closer with doesn't have you know the the job available but maybe they know someone and they can recommend me um so i think it is just about like seeing who you know, just kind of like asking what people are working on, maybe so-and-so knows this other person that can come back to you. Um, and I feel like it's it's about kind of like widening, you know, your reach that way rather than just like approaching every random person and trying to establish like a new best friend, you know? Um, so I think, you know, be, be kind to people, ask them what they're working on, um, you know, see if they know someone that, that could help you. Um, just yesterday, I, I reached out to a friend um, because I'm, I'm on the hunt for new work. Um, and I reached out to a friend who doesn't have, you know, work for me, but they, he was like, well, I'll reach out to so-and-so and this person and this person, this person. Um, and I think that's how, how it goes. It's like, I'm comfortable talking with this person that I'm much closer with, and he's going to see what's out there for me. Um, so I think that's really how it's gone pretty much most of my career, rather than finding the one random person at like, you know, a networking kind of event. I would just quickly add also that I have asked people to get coffee. Like I found, I found out that my friend was the student of one of the professors at UPenn and I just Facebook messaged him and I said, hey, um, we have a mutual contact. I'm like, I'm new to Philly and I love your work and I'm an animator and I'd love to get coffee. And we got coffee and he gave me my first teaching job which was completely shocking to me and but I was like whoa just being friendly and you know asking someone to get coffee is, is a way to get a job I had no idea and now I also have a friend who's an amazing artist that's great um I also approach networking I recently my colleague called me I mean not called me on the bad way he discovered that I actually have a superpower that I 
somehow when I meet people within the conversation, within a couple 20 minutes or so, I get them to invite me to go to their house and have dinner with them. <laughs> this happened a lot lately, I don't know why. Um, it's kind of cool. Um, but in some way, because when he was like, oh, you're really good at networking, I was like, I'm just making friends. I'm just literally having a conversation with a human being that just so happened they might work in the industry or might like animation, but I never really approached them like, and he says, like, I want something from you. Obviously, well, we all want something from each other, but also that friendship, that connection itself can just be the connection itself. Um, so I will say my advice in terms of networking, the term on its own is don't have to see it as a daunting uh, way, because I think if you see it as a networking, most likely when I see students to do is walk up to someone with a business card and say, can I, can, can I contact you? Can I show you my work? But by doing it, you already tell them, I want something from you. You don't have to, you can just go up and strike up a conversation about, you know, for example, hint, hint, we're going to go out and networking after this, you can just come up and talk to us, right? You know, have a conversation about what we just talked about, something resonates with you, stay with the conversation and go from there. Um, you know, it's just you no know, walk up with someone in the business car. I know, I know that's what you want to do. Um, but I think uh, just approach someone as a human being. Um, but then if I can take the next step, step in terms of giving you the practical advice, uh, create a LinkedIn profile. It uh, goes along with everyone to say is put yourself out there, uh, connecting with people. I encourage my students to reach out to industry professionals for two reasons. One, of course, networking. Um, you know, to to again, if you say, "Hey, I would like to meet with you. Can you? Can I show you my work?" Most likely, people might say no, but maybe one out of twenty people will say, "Cool. Of course, I'll help you out." Right, so you know, it never hurts to ask of what's the worst case could happen. They say no, or not get back to you. Right, so you're not gonna lose anything. Uh, the other thing is also, um, what was the other thing? This happens a lot. I keep like halfway through conversation, I get lost my train of thoughts. Um, and I think the other thing is about networking. Uh, reach out. See, it come, it come back. Uh, the other thing is also look at their career trajectory. I know you want to work at that one studio or one project, but the path of going to that direction could be a multiple different ways, right? There's a lot. Of, also watch credits on all the shows that you like. They're very likely working with other studios in different places. So that's where the job opportunities are. So, you know, I so this part of networking is more so like in your home, on the computer, like doing research. Uh, but then I think back to what everyone's saying is be at the place where things are happening, put your work out there, put it in the festival. Festivals absolutely love work. They also, they wanna see different work too, like something unique. If you don't put yourself out there, then they don't get to see you. So even on LinkedIn, share a post or and uh, talk about your new reels that you put together or join groups that you sh you you share interests there's a lot of discourse servers out there with different topics as well so there's a lot of ways to be out there but i'm also going to say the most important advice i can give you is be there in person show up uh because i know it's easy to hide not be, not hiding but like being your comfort zone you know being behind the monitor and talking to people right but again a lot of relationship we're talking about getting coffee and reaching out to friends is the human to human interaction is so what drives a lot of the opportunities and um quote unquote networking but it's just you're just making friends so show up, show up on time. It's all really part of the, the, the package in terms of how to get yourself out there. And the universe we know, you have to say out loud what you want. I tell my student, I ask them a question, do you think you're gonna finish your film? They're like, maybe. I'm like, no, you have to say it. I will finish my film. The universe has to hear and will make it happen. So, so you know, that might be my, non-practical advice to you to say things out loud but you have to do it as well so that would be our advice all right thank you very much
Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, we'll, we'll end the panel talk, and I invite everyone to meet us out just right outside these doors for cookies and juice and, and water and um, get a chance to talk one-on-one -on -one, uh, with our Game Changers panelists. But let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. And thank everyone for coming tonight, and we'll see you out in the lobby.